Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. You know, sometimes when you're singing to God, it overcomes your soul, and praise God, it touches you deep down. Praise God. Let's give them one more time a round of applause. Praise God. Last week uh, was the Super Bowl, and did your team win, yes or no? Okay, some of you, how many of you were not happy with the results? I loved watching at the very end, um, I loved watching the team celebrate their victory. Uh, Tom Brady grabbing the trophy with uh, the coach, what's his name, Belichick? What's his name? You don't, you're not going to admit it, right? Yeah, whatever his name is. Anyway, they're celebrating, excited. And I thought to myself, man, how, how amazing is that moment after having prepared for so long for a victory to experience it like that? And how sad and sorrowful the loss especially for people who are incredibly competitive, like many of these individuals. My wife and I understand this. We're incredibly competitive people. I mean, very competitive people. We believe it's better to win than to lose. How many of you agree with this statement? It's better to win than to lose. Okay, we have a bunch of losers in the room. (laughs) Some of you are like, it's not if you win or lose, that's how you stop it. <laughs> how many of you enjoy the victory more than you enjoy the loss? Can I get an amen? amen? Sure, of course we do. Victory is good. Losing is bad. When my family sits down to play Monopoly, it's not to spend time with each other. <laughs> I have three children, and my wife and I will play Clue. Clue is not a fun game. It's cutthroat. We're going to win. People will go to bed crying. That's the way it's going to happen in our home. We're very competitive people. We like to have competition. Victory means something in our home. So when Jonathan joined baseball for the first time, he was very young. This is Jonathan, uh, first team he ever joined. Aww. I sat down with my son, Jonathan, and I said to him, Jonathan, I, I need you to understand something. It doesn't matter Really, I, like, like, like every father sat down with my son, I said, it doesn't matter if you win or lose, but if you want us to really love you, <laughs> you'd better win or you're not coming home. Our heavenly father doesn't expect victory from us. He provides victory for us. You say, oh, for God, it doesn't matter if there's winning or losing, victory or loss. No, you couldn't be farther from the truth. He wants there to be victory in your life. He wants you to win and not lose. He wants you to overcome and not fall behind. He wants victory, but not from us. He gives us the victory and provides it for us. Victory is the goal. And that's why I bring the sermon series today from Mark chapter 4 and 5, victorious, my kingdom overthrown. There is a secret that few know and even fewer speak. It is the secret to success, fulfillment, joy, and true inner peace. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not the secret that is the cheap knockoff peddled by talk show hosts, celebrity gurus, and pop psychologists. This victory cannot be replicated, duplicated, or fabricated, but it can be yours. And in this four-week sermon series, I will prove that victory begins when your kingdom is overthrown. It starts in the heart. And that's today's sermon. In fact, this sermon series is really not as much of a sermon series as it is a one holistic sermon, today being the first part of the sermon. In fact, these are the four parts to the sermon over the next four weeks. First, it starts in the heart. That's today's sermon. Then choose your king. That's the second sermon. And then surrender your throne. That's the third sermon. I cannot wait to preach that sermon. It's about the maniac of Gadara for those who have studied the Bible. And then the fourth sermon is experience your victory. 
And each and every one of these passages that we're going to study stair steps our way to understanding victory from God's point of view. How to win from your Father in heaven's perspective. And it begins with this statement. It starts in the heart. Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20, Jesus is dealing with the heart of man, and he expresses this concept that true victory starts in the heart, so he tells a story, and Jesus would do this quite often. Where he went, he would teach, not as the scribes or the Pharisees, he taught by pointing to everyday life examples. Perhaps he was outside and teaching on a hillside, and he saw a farmer, and he saw his great group in front of him, and he said, look at this farmer over here, you see him? He's sowing seed. Some of the seed that he throws out into the field, some of it will land on, on trodden down paths. And, and a birds of the year will come and they'll eat up the seed. It'll never get in. A- another soil that the seed will fall upon is stony soil, where the seed will seep down into the soil just a bit, and then it'll spring up a little bit of a plant, but when the sun comes out, it's going to scorch the plant and it's going to wither away. Jesus said, there's a third kind of soil out there. The third kind will fall among the weeds and the thorns, and that one will grow, but it'll grow among the weeds, and the weeds will choke out the sunlight and siphon off the water and that plant will never bear fruit. And then Jesus said, but look at the farmer. There's a fourth kind of soil, and those seeds will fall into that soil, and it will grow beautifully. And much of that fruit will grow, some 30, some 60, some 100-fold. When the disciples got away with Jesus by himself, Jesus explained the meaning of this story, this parable. And we're going to understand and study this meaning of the parable as understanding this main thought once again today, that true victory starts in the heart. So I ask the question as I begin, is your heart prepared for victory? Listen to me, listen to me. You'll never experience victory until your heart is ready for it. Today, I want us to see first and foremost, point number one, the hardened soil represents the hardened heart. Say it with me together, hardened heart. Say it with me together, the hardened heart. Say it again, the hardened heart. I want to make sure you're awake today. Are there people out there? Say it with me, the hardened heart heart. Look at what it says in Mark chapter 4 and verse 14. Do you see what it says? He begins by explaining the parable and explaining what the seed is. Mark chapter 4 and verse number 14. He says, the sower sows the word. The the farmer is planting seed. The seed is representative of the word of God. How many of you in this room are thankful for the word of God today? Say amen. 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 This is the seed. And he says that the key to victory is how receptive your heart is to the Word of God. That really is the key to the entire sermon today. If you want victory, it starts in the heart. My question is, how receptive is your heart to the Word of God? He says that some people's heart is like a hardened path. And the seed tries to enter into the heart and like a seed bouncing off of concrete, so it is the Word of God touches some people's hearts and it just bounces off of them. They're not interested in God's Word. Look, he goes on in verse 15. He says, and these are the ones by the wayside where the Word is sown. When they hear it, Satan comes immediately and takes away the Word that was sown in their hearts like a seed bouncing off of concrete. These people will not receive the truth. Even though the Bible says it, they reject it. Now, we all make mistakes. Agreed? How many of you in this room are like me? Sometimes you make mistakes. Would you raise your hand? How many of you like me? Some of you are not raising your hand. This is your first. We're all sinners, the Bible says, and sometimes we accidentally sin, and sometimes we purposefully sin, 
even though the Bible says we ought not. Well, for example, the Bible says, thou shalt not lie. Don't bear false witness. Don't lie. How many of you agree it's wrong to lie? Say amen. amen. How many of you think it's wrong to lie even in church, especially in church? Say amen. amen. How many of you think it's wrong to be deceptive even especially from the pulpit? Everybody's like, where is this going? <laughs> oh, I have a confession to make. I lied. Uh, what do you mean, Pastor? Last Sunday. How many of you were here last Sunday? Some of you were. Last Sunday, I, I put a quote up on the screen. Here's the quote. I, it's a great quote. It says, the greatest compliment that can be paid to any man is to be hated by certain people. Great quote by A.W. Tozier. Not true. You say, who is it by? I have no idea. <laughs> it said A.W. Tozier. And uh, this last week, I had several people from the church. They contacted me. They said, Pastor, I would love to know where you got that reference so I can study that quote in context. Where did you get the, the quote? And I had to reply, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly where you want your pastor studying from. You know what I mean? <laughs> Spending deep time in the word of Facebook, you know. <laughs> now, how many of you agree? If the Bible says don't lie, we should not lie. Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, the Bible says, say the Bible says. Bible says. The Bible says, say it again. Bible the Bible says thou shalt not lie. The Bible says, Bible says. The Bible says thou shalt not have sex outside of marriage except between a man and a woman. Oh, go back to lying, Pastor. No, but it does. It does. Like, that's what the Bible says. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. If the Bible says it, we're supposed to hear it. Now, some people, you say, don't lie. Why? Because the Bible says, bounces right off their heart. But the Bible also says, we need to be pure in our sexuality between a husband and wife in a married relationship. And that bounces off the heart. I remember I sat with a man. Um, I shared this in our Hillside group last Monday for 18 to 28-year-olds. And a lot of them were like, that really happened? It really happened. I one of my jobs, you have to understand, my job is not just to be your preacher, but to be your pastor. Over the years, I've met a lot of people who only want me to be their preacher. Come on Sunday and tell me the Bible, but do not get involved in my life. Well, you have to understand, part of my job as a pastor is to shepherd your soul, which means it's going to happen. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? Some of you are like, amen? I don't know. So this is what I do. Sometimes uh, my job and the jobs of our small group leaders and our pastors is to shepherd you, which means I preach to you the word of God, but I also come to you if there's an area in your life where you're not walking with the Lord, I help correct that. And you, by the way, can do the same thing in my life. Can I get an amen? amen. So anyway, I went out. I, one of the things I often have a conversation with, if this has happened many, many times, there's a man in the church and he was a, a member of the church and he was living with his girlfriend and they were living together as if they were married, but they weren't married, which the Bible says is sin. Having sex before marriage with, is, is a sin. You say, really? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says God will judge it. Because I'm a good pastor and I don't want these people to be judged by God without knowing, I go and warn them. So what I did was, and I, I, I've done this many times, I'll sit over coffee or over at Del Taco. And I took the man to Del Taco. I sat down with the man at Del Taco. I said, man, it's good to see you. Let's eat some tacos. And we're sitting there over a couple tacos. And I said, hey, can I ask you a question? He said, sure, pastor. He, I said, I said you're, you're, you're with, uh, and I named the girl. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, how long have you been together? He said, well, it's been like two years now. I said, man, that's awesome. That's great. I said, you guys are, are in love? This was his response. He's like, yeah. I said, okay, okay, okay. I said, now, you guys live together, right? He said, oh, yeah. And I said, now this is personal, but I'm your pastor, so here we go. And he's like, what? And I said to him, I said, you're having sex together like you're married, but you're not, right? You say, you say that kind of stuff? I'm a very bold person. <laughs> You'd be surprised what you can say with a smile on your face, you know what I mean? I'm like, so you guys are having sex together, right? And he said, he said, yeah. I said, hey, now look, here's the thing. The Bible says that that's sin, and your relationship will not be blessed unless you confess that sin, forsake it, and get out of that relationship, or get married. And he looked at me, and he said, he said, um, I said, so do you love her? He said, ah. I said, you want to marry her? He said, here's the deal, pastor. He said, I'd like to marry, but the reality is, if I were to, 
I respect the institution of marriage too much. That's what he said to marry her. I said, what do you mean? He said, if I married her, I would have to stop having sex with other women. I said, what, 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 what? He said, I respect the institution of marriage so much, and I'm, I'm, I like to be with other women. And I said, wait, 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 are you telling me that she believes she's in an exclusive relationship with you, but you're sleeping around on her, and because it's marriage, you're... He said, yeah. Well, I lost my temper just a little bit. I did. I looked at him. I said, hey, man, look. I said, the problem is you're taking advantage of this woman. And I said, all you're doing is waiting around for someone else that's better than her so that you can dump her and go to them. And I said, it's wrong, it's sin, and that's what the Bible says. Well, he did not handle that well. Do you know why? Because he had a hard heart. You say, who are you? Nobody, but the Bible says it's wrong. Now, some of you a moment ago said, well, I don't have a hard heart, but if I came to you with your sin and the Bible, would you be willing enough to receive it? That's the way you know if you have a hard heart. The Bible says, oh my goodness, it got quiet. <laughs> the Bible says, the Bible says it's wrong to hold bitterness in your heart. Look at me. I sat with a woman years ago. And she had been offended and hurt by people. Anybody in this room ever been offended or hurt by somebody before? Sure. Look, raise your hand. How many of you ever been offended or hurt by somebody before? Okay. Happens. She had been offended or hurt so much, I sat with her over counseling. It was a long time, and because I'm her pastor, I love her, and I'm sharing with her. I opened up the Bible, and I said to her, I said, dear, my dear sweet sister, don't you understand that the offense that you allow to rest in your heart is becoming anger and wrath and bitterness, and the Bible says it'll destroy you like a seed bouncing off of concrete, gone. Now, I'm not trying to ruin their life. I'm trying to help them. Hear me. Some of us... If we're honest, we have a hardened heart. Now look at me. If you're here today, say, oh my gosh, I don't want that. Listen to me, listen to me. You ought to pray and beg out to God. Oh God, break my heart. God, forgive me for being so hard to your truth and to your word. Otherwise, you'll remain hard the rest of your life and the word of God will never penetrate. That's hard preaching, but it's true. Number one, we see the hardened heart. Number two, we see the deceptive heart. Jesus is not finished. He explained four soils, and now he's going to explain what those four soils represented. Number one, the hardened heart. Number two, the deceptive heart. Say deceptive heart with me. Look at verse 16. These likewise are the ones who are sown on stony ground, who, when they hear the word of God, immediately they receive it with gladness. This happens all the time at Southern Hills. People visit the church and like, man, I really like the music. People are friendly. The pastor is amazing. Amen. Okay, that was nice and forced. Then they love it and with gladness they receive it, but, but look at, look at the rest of the verse. And they have no root in themselves. It's not real to them. And so they endure only for a time, and afterward, when tribulation and persecution arise for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. You see, these people appear to have received the word of God, but they fade away quickly. I remember I was speaking with a woman in pastoral counseling years ago who wanted to marry a man that was not a Christian. The Bible teaches that Christians ought to marry people in their own faith so that there's no conflict. And she came to me and she said, Pastor, could you talk with him about Jesus? Maybe he'll be saved. And I said, sure, absolutely, I love that. So I went to Del Taco. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, why Del Taco? I, I don't know. I, I question it all the time. It's not very good. I have no idea why. But with the Del Taco, we're sitting over Del Taco, and I'm talking to the man. And this was, uh, in, in reality, I remember talking to him, whether it was at Del Taco or Starbucks or whatever it was. I remember sitting there talking to him, 
And I remember I, I shared with them, I said, I shared with them that God loves them and Jesus died for his sins and that we're all sinners and because of our sin we deserve hell, but Jesus loves us and died for us and was buried and rose from the grave. And all he needed to do was repent to receive Christ as Savior. And I looked across the table at him, I said, does that all make sense? And this was his response. He said, sure. And I thought, well, maybe he's not getting it, so I, I explained a little bit more. I said, the Bible, lo- the Bible says God loves you even though we're all sinners. Have you ever sinned before? Sure. I said, sin is anything we've done that, that is displeasing to God, think, say, uh, uh, disobeying God. Have you ever disobeyed God's law? Yeah. I said, then Jesus died for your sins. He took your punishment. You could die and go to hell, but Jesus wanted to save you. And he died and he was buried and rose from the grave and he, he's offering you salvation. Do you want to be saved? And Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay. He looked at me and he said, Now? I said, sure. (laughs) (laughs) And right there, he put on a little show for me. He bowed his head and prayed, asked Jesus to save him. I remember walking out saying, I I, I don't know, man. I don't don't know. I don't know is hard, but from what I saw, I just, I, I don't know. After they had gotten married, because now he was a Christian. (laughs) It was three months before I never saw him again. A lot of people have reasons why they're deceptive in their Christian faith. See, what are you talking about, Pastor? There's a lot of reasons why people deceive others when it comes to their own faith. Now, look at me. What I'm stating bluntly is this. Throughout Christian history, there have always been people who have pretended to believe, and they sit in church as if they're true believers. There are a lot of reasons for this. Some, it's because of dating. Well, if I'm going to get her, then I need to pretend to be one. For some, it's for business. They come to church because it's a good business opportunity. I'm going to do business here. They're deceptive. For some, it's curiosity. They look in and they see what everybody, oh man, this is really interesting. And that's great. The problem is instead of being converted to Christ, they are deceptive. For some, it's politics. For some, it's luck. See, they're not truly believers in Jesus, but they think to themselves, if I go to church, maybe I'll get more lucky and they'll add Jesus to their tokens of luck for their life. For some, it's family peace. Teenagers who have no true belief in their heart, but just to keep the peace at home, they're going to pretend until they get out. Hear me. Hear me. They will always wither away because they never had a true root. Look, they were never saved to begin with. You as Christians and I as a Christian have seen the same thing over and over. They walk away from the faith because they were never of the faith. There is an appearance of life, but the Word of God never truly penetrated their heart. They were never truly rooted in Christ. Deceived. A few years ago, probably about three years ago now, I was, I was involved in a hit and run. This time it wasn't my fault, you know. Okay. <clears throat> uh, it wasn't me, it was actually Heather. She's riding down Blue Di- uh, Rainbow, and somebody came from behind and, and, and hit her bumper. And before she knew what was going on, the guy took off, like gone. So there was no exchange of information, no police called, nothing. And now she's dealing with this broken bumper. She comes home and she told me what happened. I'm like, oh man, what are we going to do? So we looked it up. It's going to be over $1,000 to fix this bumper. We thought, $1,000? This is ridiculous. Got to replace the whole thing. Man, this is going to be a pain. This is terrible. Oh, well, no problem. The next day, we were planning on getting some stuff done, but we had friends in town and they wanted to go see a movie together. I remember what movie it was. It was the Lego movie. Everything is awesome. Thank you. One person. Very good. We're going to go see this movie together, and and we still had the broken bumper. I pulled into the gas station on Blue Diamond near Dean Martin, and uh, as I did, I pulled into that gas station, and somebody pulled a truck behind me. We were on our way to the movie theater, and the guy said, hey, I see your bumper. I said, what? I said, I see your bumper. I came around. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I got smashed. He said, I can fix it for you. I said, you can? He said, absolutely. I said, how much? He said, only 200 bucks. I'm like, sweet mother. 
this is fantastic. Now, some of you are already thinking to yourself, no, pastor, no. <laughs> Don't do it. I was not very, I finished filling up. I said, oh, I'm going to the movies. He said, fantastic. He said, go to the movies, park in the parking lot. And what I'll do is I'll just fix it while you're in there. I said, really? Only 200 bucks? I said, he said, absolutely. So I pulled in the parking lot. I remember I got out of the car. He opened up his trunk. There's a bunch of paint and a bunch of materials. I'm like, this is a real man. This real working dude. He knows what he's doing. You know, this is going to be great. So I handed over two $100 bills after stopping at the ATM and walked into the movie theater, sat down, the trailers started to play, and as the trailers played, I thought to myself, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> this might not be a good idea. <laughs> How many of you know exactly what I found when I walked out of the movie theater that day? Broken bumper. Yeah, the broken bumper is still there. <laughs> you say, why? Because he was one who deceived others for a living. Now look at me, look at me, look at me. It's one thing to be deceived by someone else. It's another thing to deceive yourself. And some of you have been pretending to be a true believer for so long, you've begun to, you've begun to fool your own self. Listen to me. You can fool me. You can fool others. You can fool your family. But friend, you'll never fool God. Have you been saved? Have you been born again? You know, some of you in this room, I'm telling you, there are those in this room, you know you never got saved. But now you're at the point where you've been pretending for so long, you think to yourself, well, maybe it took somewhere along the way. No, it doesn't take that way. Listen, you don't get saved by osmosis. You get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ in a moment where you repent of your sin and receive Christ as your Savior, where you understand what Christ did for you, who you are and who he is, and you call upon him in a moment of desperation and say, save my soul. Have you been saved or are you playing a game? The reason I'm concerned for you is this, because one day it will be obvious to you and to all. Because when tribulation arises and persecutions and difficulties come and the sun of life scorches on you, because you have no root, you will wither away. Be careful. The clock is ticking. You're at a fragile place in your momentary life. The word has touched your heart, but it is yet to penetrate your soul. And I'm saying to you, friend, you got to get saved if you've never been saved. You need to be born again. It's not enough to just come to church and be a nice person. Have you been saved? Now, before I move on, I want to speak to the individual who is new to Jesus. You are just growing in your faith. You got saved a week or a month or two years ago or a year ago, and you're like, oh, maybe I'm not saved. Listen, if you can look to a time in your life and you say, you know what? I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I have asked Christ to save my soul. I repented and received that gift of salvation then don't let anybody make you doubt your salvation. But hear my words. There are those in this room who have been deceptive for so long, and right now, deep in your heart, you know it. And where you're going to finally get to victory is whenever you get rid of the hardened heart and the deceptive heart. And thirdly, we see the cluttered heart. Number three today, Jesus points to a third type of soil. This is the soil that the seed was sown among the thorns and the weeds and the thistles. And look at what it says in verse 18, the cluttered heart. Now these are the ones that were sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Okay, what is this person? This person genuinely and truly does receive the Word of God, but they become consumed by the world, by wealth, by worry, by other things. The, the type of phrases you'll hear is this, man, I sure would love to spend time in the Bible, but I'm so busy. Man, I sure would love to be in charge, but man, I mean, life is busy. It's not that they're not believers, but their heart has become cluttered with so much superfluous things. The Word of God is one of their least concerns. If you get around to it, you get around to it. How many of you in this room have ever heard of Marie Kondo? 
How many of you know who this is? Would you raise your hand? Let, let's see it. Hi, raise your hand. If you, you know who this is, Marie Kondo, raise your hand. How many of you have no idea? Would you raise your hand? Okay, she's coming for you. <laughs> she is, man. She is. How many of you, the very moment I used the word cluttered, when you saw it, you thought of Marie. You're like, oh, man. Now, now, if you're not familiar with Marie, she's on Netflix, and she's all about cleaning up our mess. There's too much clutter in our lives, and we can't enjoy our lives with all the clutter. Um, she's kind of the next generation of, how many of you remember the show Hoarders? You remember that show? My wife always wanted to watch Hoarders. Let's watch Hoarders. I'm like, no, I can't. She said, why? Because it makes me sick, <laughs> like in my stomach. There's always a cat in the freezer, and I'm always like, why do they have a cat in the freezer? That's not good. Like... You're not going to need that cat. Now, I may have offended you. If you have a cat in your freezer at home, I apologize. But you need to get rid of the cat. I love you. I tell you because I love you. It's gross. And Marie Kondo, she's all about making sure the clutter is out of our lives. And the concept that she really gets across so often is this, that there is a great feeling that comes along with purging things out of our life. To purge feels great when you can get rid of things you don't need. It's hard at first, isn't it, to let go of stuff? Now, look at me. Look at me. Marie's interested in your closet. I'm interested in your heart. My question is, how cluttered is your heart? How much is in there that you don't need? I'm not necessarily talking about bad things. I'm talking about the cares of this world. A person's heart can be so overly cluttered that they can barely focus on the Lord. I'm talking about things like sports. Oh, man, pastor, are we going to be surprised if anybody ever comes back to this church? Now, look at me. I'm not saying the sports are bad, but for some of us, sports have become our God. Oh, I'll make it to church as soon as my sport is over. For some of you, it's not just watching sports, it's making sure that you live vicariously through your children. So when their season is over, maybe I'll show up to church. Let me ask you a question. What is that saying to your children? Could it be that your life is so cluttered that you can never, you can never receive the word because your life, like a plant growing up, is so choked out by all this junk? It's not just sports, it's entertainment. It's work. Look, every one of us have to have a job. Can I get an amen? amen. How many, everybody's got to have a job, amen? amen? Some of you are not saying amen, I'd like to know you, you know what I mean? <laughs> but your work, listen to me, your work has gone beyond. Your work is beyond, beyond, this is what I need to do. It has become a God in your life, and it's choking out the Word of God. It's choking out that which can help you. For some of us, it's a hobby. We spend more time in our hobby than we do with the Word of God. For some of us, listen, for some of us, we're so cluttered in our life by things even like Facebook. I mean, we can't get up in the morning. We don't get up in the morning and search the everlasting Word of God. We get up in the morning, we got to check if anybody liked our post. What I'm saying is exactly what Jesus was telling his people 2,000 years ago. The cares of this world, materialism, money. Mater Look, let me say this about materialism. Materialism has become the plague of the American church. It's not wrong to have good things. It's wrong when the good things have choked out a desire for the Word of God in our lives. A cluttered heart, my dear friend, listen to me will never be an open heart. And if you want victory in your life, and I don't know about you, but I'm competitive. I want victory in my life. Victory starts in the heart. You'll never have victory here or here or here. This is where victory lies. It starts in the heart, and this is what Jesus says in our fourth point today, Mark chapter 4. We see that the open heart is a soft heart. The open heart is a honest heart. The open heart is a clean heart, a decluttered heart. Look at verse 20. But these, these are the ones who sown on good ground, those who hear the word. They accept the word, and they bear fruit. 
some 30-fold, some 60, some 100. Let me explain. My desire for you is that you, your tree, will flourish and blossom, and the fruit will come from you. You say, what fruit? The fruit is the reward of having an open heart. You say, what is the fruit? I'm glad you asked. The apostle Paul explains what it is in Galatians chapter 5. He says in Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These are the fruits of the Spirit. How many of you in this room, get me before I leave today, how many of you in this room would love to have a little peace in your life? Can I get an amen? How many of you in this room would love to have a little joy in your life? Can I get an amen? How many of you in this room would love to have more patience? You're not patient. How many of you would love to have more patience? Can I get an amen? Be more gentle. Be a good person. Have self-control. How many of you would love these fruits in your life? God is explaining to you how you get those fruits by having an open heart. The goal of Jesus is not to ruin your life, it's to make your life fruitful. And me as his messenger, it's not to make you angry or to ruin your life, it's to make your life fruitful. I want the best for you. My concern... My concern is that the moment will slip away and the truth will be lost forever from your heart. By far the best purchase, I'll end with this, the best purchase I made in 2017, 2018, I should say, was Apple EarPods. How many of you know what these are? Raise your hand. How many of you sprung for these? It's a ridiculous high price. Over $100, like $130. Back in early last year, I said, I'm gonna, I, I want them. I need them. I'm a materialistic man. Give them to me. Give me these. Now. So I went out and I bought them. Put them on me. They're fantastic because you can work out. You can go anywhere. You can do whatever. You, and there's not these strings attached. I loved it. Love them. Love them. Last week, um, I told you this, last week, the week before last, I went out with a bunch of guys who went snowboarding um, up in uh, Utah. Here's a photograph of me uh, when I was a great jump. I'm... Again, I lied. That's great. I'll apologize next week. <laughs> it was the end of the day, almost 4 o'clock. The lifts were about to close. And I had found myself alone on the mountain. Everybody had gone different directions. I went down one side and I saw a lift that was going to the top of the mountain. I checked my watch and sure enough, I had four minutes to make the lift and to go to the top. I found out one of the great goals of skiing and snowboarding is to be on a lift when things are closing down so you get one last run. And I got on the lift and we started going up to the top of the mountain by myself and I thought, what a perfect moment. Nothing could make this better. Perfect, beautiful, amazing. And then I thought, no, something could make it better. I know what could make it better. I could listen to music on my way down. And so I, I had my phone with me and I had my ear pods in my pocket, and I reached inside of my snowsuit down deep into my pocket, and I pulled out my ear pods, and without thinking, I took off my gloves, and I took off my helmet a hundred feet off of the snow, and I opened up the container. Again, how many of you are thinking, our pastor is not the brightest bulb in the bunch? <laughs> Some of you are already like, why do we come here? I, this guy, I mean, for real, this guy. And I reached out, this is true, I, I, I was just thinking about the music. And I reached in to grab the, the first uh, pod and I, I went to put it in my ear and it slipped out of my hand. And as soon as it did, by instinct, I grabbed a hold of my face like this. And I started to pray, I pray about everything, Jesus please, Jesus no. Oh Lord Jesus please, help me, Jesus, heaven, heaven, heaven above, oh God help me. My, my, lo my beloved ear pods that cost $139 are falling. And I'm thinking it's caught right here. That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, okay, I got to be very careful. And so I put my other hand up here and I hold it like this. And I looked in my hands and it was gone. I said, oh no, the devil got it, you know. The devil got my ear pod. And I looked down at my lap and on my slick snowsuit, 
resting on the edge is the ear pod. And with the stealth of a ninja, I slowly reach down. And I'm praying the whole time, oh God, please don't, no, please don't. No. And I grabbed it. And I said, oh. I put them in my ears. I put my helmet down. I locked it in place. I got off and I just praised Jesus, you know. <laughs> my concern for you is this, is that this moment and this truth is going to slip away from you. That this series that has been designed to teach you victory and that victory is not made and found in the way you think it is. Is going to slip from your fingers and be gone. And 10 years, 5 years, 20 years down the road, you'll sit and say, what happened? And God had it for you now. You see, It starts in the heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word has been so powerful, true, poignant in our lives. And I pray that every one of us in this room would not only hear these truths and have an open heart, but be ready for the weeks to come as we see how victory is truly made. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world.